But Donald Trump, I'd like to look established to honor the innovative theoretical perspective and rigorous methodological quantity report approach championed by Donald Trump for many years at the University of Chicago. These same laboratory characteristics are exemplified by our distinguished speaker today, Professor Michael Guzanaga from the University of California, Santa Barbara, who was the unanimous selection of the, uh, the speaker committee this past year. Michael's contribution to the social and behavioral sciences and to the neurosciences have earned him membership in the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine as well as being recognized as the father of cognitive neuroscience. As an undergraduate at Dartmouth College, Michael became interested in how the brain enabled the mind. In the summer of 1960, Michael worked with, in Roger Sperry's laboratory at Caltech to extend Sperry's research on soot brain in cats and monkeys to research in humans. Over the past 55 years, Michael's pioneering research on split brain patients has explored perception, language, facial recognition, reasoning, social cognition, and many other cognitive processes. In addition to a brilliant scientific career, Michael is well known for his dedication to the education and training of the next generation of students and scientists, for instance, through the Summer Institute in Cognitive Neuroscience, which has transformed the field. His leadership in various administrative roles, including the MacArthur Foundation's research network on the law and the neurosciences, which helped bring work in the law into the 21st century, and his brilliant series of books on the brain, which has inspired and advanced public appreciation for and understanding of the human neuroscience and brain. Generally, Michael issues travel and speaking engagements, so I want to add my personal thanks to Michael for making an exception to being here today. Uh, Michael, we have a plaque in recognition. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. And I highly recommend to all of you to be hosted by John and Stephanie Cassiopo. It's a one of a kind experience, and I thank you. And I'm deeply honored to be not only at this great university, but to give the, the Donald Fisk uh, lecture. I, I did not know Donald Fisk, but I certainly know his daughter, and I certainly know his contribution to the methodology and the development of psychological science. <clears throat> Tonight, today, I am going to review uh, my uh, experience uh, uh, in the 50 years that we've been carrying out uh, split brain research, which requires a special methodology that is so simple, you will all be able to understand it, and wish you could have been me, because it didn't take much in methodology. It took a little cleverness in the understanding of patients and uh, what they do and what they may teach you, but it's an interesting contrast uh, to uh, to these methodological issues. You keep you you were more free to keep the questions in mind. And you didn't have much argument about the, the methodology. Just a little point to make uh, along the way. And I have to also mention that uh, the University of Chicago has uh, touched uh, me in many ways, uh, one of which was I may have been here. Uh, and so in 1964, 65, I think it was that era, uh, George Beadle uh, was trying to hire Roger Sperry, my mentor. and like any big lab chief, uh, he brings people along who, uh, who run the lab. And so we visited here. Uh, and I'll, the only thing I remember about the trip is we stayed in the now defunct Morrison uh, Hotel. So that was uh, qu quite an experience. And I've often wondered, uh, with looking back, what, what, how my life would have been different uh, if I had taken that job. Or he had taken the job. I didn't even know that. <laughs> well, I never knew why he did it. So instead, I want to tell this story about the split brain work, the split brain human work that, uh, that happened in the 1960s, 61, 62. And uh, it was the, uh, the anniversary paper of that uh, was uh, published by uh, Sperry, Bogan, and myself back in 62. And it was recently uh, the, the PNAS journal was looking for a 
uh, papers that might have had an impact in the field. And when it comes to psychology, interestingly, uh, we qualified because we were the only paper in <laughs> psychology. And uh, the, the journal being devoted highly to other matters of science, physics, uh, a lot of molecular biology and the like. So, uh, uh, so the story is, is this. And it's still as stunning today as it is, uh, was stunning uh, 50 years ago when we discovered it. And that is that as the consequence of a surgeon disconnecting the two cerebral hemispheres, you turned one mind into two. And this was a huge uh, shock to people at the time because the notion was that we were a undivided self, there was one mind, there couldn't possibly be two. It was an affront to some people, a curiosity to others. And, uh, and it was that moment that uh, when we made that discovery that, uh, that captured us and it turned out uh, I wound up spending 50 years trying to understand uh, what, it, what it meant. So in the, in the story that I want to tell, I want to tell not only about uh, the kind of little special storm that appeared at Caltech in those days, but the power of the institution that uh, hosts scientists and their attitudes about their, their science and their scientists. Uh, and I want to uh, introduce the fact that a life in science uh, is just a hell of a lot of fun. And it shouldn't be forgotten. And so a lot of this is addressed to the uh, upcoming generation as you decide what you really want to do. Uh, do not uh, think that science isn't a lot of fun because you can have a lot of fun in it and around it. So the, the, the I'll just flash these up. These were the six papers that made up the fundamental uh, observation in, in, in the split brain work. First, the phenomenon. Then secondly, how the somatosensory was mapped in the disconnected hemispheres and what we could learn about ipsilateral, contralateral pathways. Third, about how visual processes might vary between the two hemispheres. Fourth, the surprising effects on language. Uh, of course, the left hemisphere being predominantly dominant with language and speech, but seeing remnants of some kind of language also in the right hemisphere. Fifth, the work showing that the right hemisphere was uh, superior as was predicted, but demonstrated they're uh, superior in certain kinds of uh, visual, perceptual, visual, motor uh, tasks as opposed to the left. And that, that basic observation really uh, gave birth to the left brain, right brain uh, story. And six, then how the, uh, each hemisphere could manage either the left half, or the opposite, uh, contralateral uh, half of the body, uh, and to some extent the ipsilateral. And in doing all that, we presented it in sort of a uh, flat-footed way. I mean, this is one of the first interesting points, is that uh, neither Sperry, who at the time was probably the senior neurobiologist in the world, had any experience with human patients. And I was a young kid. And I certainly had no experience. So we just saw, saw the problem simply as, as, well, input, output, how could you describe this and not use uh, the fancy clinical neurological terms that are used. And those terms were not used, interestingly, in defining the original case, even though they're consistent with the classic neurological uh, vocabulary. So, uh, but this is the, of course, the real story. These are the three patients uh, out of uh, the Caltech series that uh, we studied so extensively. One thing that was on Tom Sperry's side, I guess. Okay. This may be the end of it. <laughs> There's hope for an early adjournment here. I never had a class that, that was unhappy being dismissed early. I don't know about. <laughs> You ready to go? OK, have a little fun. So uh, these, were the, these were the Caltech uh, big three. Uh, for the first case, WJ uh, on the left. The second case, uh, uh, NG. And uh, the third case, LD. And if we, sh if we showed that over again. Yeah, well, anyway, this, this is, this is uh, LB postoperatively just showing that he was a normal 13, 12, 13 year old kid at the time, and uh, he was just being a smart aleck there and, and spelling out anti disestablishmentarianism, <laughs> just, to, just to show he had his oats. So, all these patients uh, 
were largely uh, just utterly normal in their parents' conversation. Everybody in this room could have a split brain, and you couldn't tell it unless you put them in front of a uh, appropriate testing device, lateralized inputs, and, and all the rest. Anyway, so this is the basic uh, picture that summarizes the, the basic uh, split brain uh, studies, for those of you who don't know this. Uh, so if everybody fixates the point there, uh, and I asked you what you see, you would say, oh, I, see the word, uh, I see the word key and I see the word ring. And uh, you could either then retrieve it, instead of answering it, you could retrieve the appropriate object with either hand. You're totally integrated. All information is uh, integrated across uh, the hemispheres because you have your corpus callosum cut. So that's nothing surprising there. Now you come in and disconnect this, these two brains for, in an effort to control uh, epilepsy. And you have now a different story. So the, the, when the patients wake up from their surgery, you say to them, fixate the point in such a similar sort of arrangement. And you say, what do you see? They say, well, I see the word ring. And they completely uh, deny, reject the idea that there's anything else on the screen. But then over years of testing, you find out that the left hemisphere, which sends its somatosensory, its touch information to the right brain, can easily find the matching uh, stimulus. So it goes out underneath the table, plows through some objects, and picks up the stimulus, uh, which for, for the left hand is the word key. Yeah, I didn't tell the fundamental point here, which is that things to the uh, right of that fixated point go to your left brain, things to the left go to the right brain. That's, that's just the way we're all hooked up. So in this manner, you could test the psychological functions uh, present and absent uh, in each half brain. And over years, this was worked out in many of its dimensions and uh, ways. And where was it worked out? Well, this is the little bit about the importance of the institution that, uh, where science goes on. This is Caltech biology. And Caltech is one of the great institutions of the world, just like yours. And it's small. And it, it has a, a quality. So here's a picture of uh, the laboratory where we did the work. That was uh, Roger Sperry's office. That was my office. Same size as his. You know. <laughs> and uh, which is just to say the graduate students were treated very well. And when you went there, the hierarchy almost dissolved. It was just you were part of the conversation. And down the hall was uh, A. H. Sturdivant, the great geneticist, Ed Lewis, his student. Uh, uh, Ray Owen, the great immunologist, Linus Pauling. I mean, come on. Uh, uh, these guys were around like uh, assistant professors. It was just do it. You can talk about it so long, right? And then just, just do it. Just get out there and do it. Get the resource and do it. And of course, getting the resource in those days was zero problem, which is a, uh, a fact of life that we all should consider what the impact of that is on science. And these guys, who were also part of the scene, uh, gave rise to a milieu. Every one of these people, are, these are just not up here as poster childs. Every one of these guys, from Feynman to Pauling to Mary Gelman to Sturdivant to Max Delbruck to Seymour Benzer to, to Renato Delbecco, these guys stopped you in the hall and asked you what you were doing, a graduate student. And you would offer something. I remember the, the interaction I had with Pauling. It was one of my first interactions there. I was actually uh, between my junior and senior year at Dartmouth. I just come there for that fellowship John mentioned. And I was trying to anesthetize the half brain of a rabbit. And to do this uh, required anesthetizing the rabbit, of course, putting uh, electrodes uh, on its brain and hooking it up to an EEG machine. And since there was no extra room in the lab, I did it in the hallway. And uh, so I was doing it, and the, the pins were flying back and forth, the paper was spewing out. And the whole scene, and I'm sitting there with ether trying to hit the crowd. Yeah, anyway. Linus Pauling walks by. And walks by, and kind of looks at this thing. Looks at me, looks at me, and says, you know, you ought to hook those electrodes up to a bowl of jelly and shake it. See if you get the same sort of response out of these things. <laughs> And he walked on. And uh, 
Now, I'm viewing that as a positive interaction, but uh, he may have been trying to tell me something there. But the point is that uh, these people actually, it was a time when everybody did interact, and they, they asked you questions, and they were interested in you, and it, I just can't say enough uh, about the place. Um, oh, 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 yeah, this is a little, and then, of course, they all got Nobel Prizes. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is our Nobel Prize with, with Roger Sperry, and uh, you will notice here something that's very interesting. University of Chicago is everywhere. Uh, Mitch Glickstein, PhD from University of Chicago, he was a senior postdoctoral. There's Mary Sherman sitting right there in the front row. Uh, University of Chicago, of course, Roger Sperry's University of Chicago. And it was an incredible, these were the Sperry people, these were the immediate people uh, in and around the lab that, that made the place uh, so special. So here is the, here is the, the film that captured the, the split brain phenomenon that showed that one hemisphere was specialized for certain kinds of visual events, the right hemisphere, and it could nicely control the left hand to do these particular kinds of tasks. And the left talking dominant hemisphere that we all use all the time couldn't get the right hand to do this simple little task. Simple little task, as you can see there, is I will throw some blocks down, and there's a little visual image there, and they had the, the patient had to arrange the blocks to match the picture. I mean, it couldn't be simpler. Arrange four blocks to match the picture. And you will see uh, how W.J. Uh, did this. And, uh, and of course, all these stories have side stories. This is a good film. It's well done. You can see, actually, the experiment. <laughs> and this contrasts with the films I took in the lab, which were horrible. Uh, but I took them alone. I didn't know what I was doing. I had a motorized thing above. The lights were wrong. And, da -da -da -da. and I get to know this guy, Baron Wallman, uh, who was a photographer. And I finally said, Baron, how about you coming down to WJ's house and film this thing? Fine. And uh, Baron went on to be the founder of Rolling Stones magazine. So you never know. <laughs> you know. Be nice to everybody. OK. Whoa, where'd it go? So here we go. Watch this film. This, this, this became emblematic of, of uh, the split brain thing. Well, this is not going to work here. <laughs> so now what do we do? That's a video that should run. Yeah. Well, we have the savior here. That could, okay, thank you. I, I got to learn what he just did. <laughs> I got to see what's going on. Anyway, so here he is. This is a right hemisphere specialized task. And here is the left hand, uh, easily capable of uh, arranging the blocks to match the stimulus. Now we let the, this is the, this is the hand now that could write a letter home. It's purely, completely literate. Uh, it's, it's being controlled by its left hemisphere. And for the life of him, WJ can't figure out how to do this and from that hemisphere. The life of him, see that life of it, the life of the left hemisphere. Uh, and all these questions were always on our mind in those days. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, this is purely we're counting on the fact that the motor response is directed by the one hem particular hemisphere. Now you couldn't do that in later patients, uh, which gets into the weeds as to why. But it has to do with the fact that we've got to see the big moment here. Uh, I should edit this, obviously. But there's a moment here where, which gave rise to uh, the whole notion that, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So the left hand knows how to do it. I'm just looking at the same stuff. The right hand doesn't know how to do it, and you saw it come in to try to help out. And later on in the film, you see them uh, 
try to, uh, we let both hands be free to do it, then they would not cooperate. Okay, so what do we do? There we go. Oh, you hit another button. All right. So overall, through a bunch of tests and over many years, uh, we came up with these notions that there was specialization going on in the left and the right brain. Here's a cartoon of all that kind of thing. And basically that there were parallel modules uh, distributed in each hemisphere that somehow interacted to produce uh, our cognitive sense of unity, cognitive me mental unity. And uh, the, the field took many, many years and many, many patients, uh, not, not so many patients, many, many, many scientists working on this to, to establish uh, this view. But the sidelight was that, uh, it, of course, it isn't that simple, and I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, this view became way overpopularized, way overstated, as all things do. But it captured, it did capture a fundamental point. There was a left hemisphere that was verbal, articulate, capable of high order thought, and the right hemisphere has these specializations in some aspects of visual training and visual motor skills. So you had this, then that got extrapolated into analytic versus creative, and that's where it kind of went off the rails. But this is a little interlude too to the notion that uh, I was discovering that uh, at the time I had a uh, political interest and uh, I didn't just want to do the science all the time, which was all consuming, uh, but uh, there was time for outside fun. And so I got the idea with a couple of buddies to start something called the Graduate Committee for Political Education. Yes, that's me with Barry Goldwater. <laughs> and I got him to promote, he was coming through Caltech for some reason, to promote a uh, idea I had, which is to have a debate at the Hollywood Palladium, this 3,000 seat auditorium on Hollywood Boulevard, uh, between a liberal and a conservative, uh, Bill Buckley and Steve Allen, the comedian, and to have a debate on the uh, foreign policy of uh, Jack Kennedy. And I don't know where I got that, but Kennedy had been in town at the Palladium. Who knows how this stuff comes about? But anyway, so, this is part of this Caltech thing of just do it. So I did it. I rented the Palladium. I contracted with these guys. And we put them up on the stage together. And, uh, and two hours before the event, only 200 tickets had been sold. I was looking through future indebtedness of about $10,000. And uh, all of a sudden, in only LA this happens, 3,000 people show up, buy their tickets, walk in. And these guys have a whale of a time going at each other. And in the front row was none other than Groucho Marx. <laughs> right? So Groucho Marx, you know, sitting there, Buckley spots him and turns to Steve Allen and says, let's face it, the foreign policy of Jack Kennedy might as well have been written by the Marx Brothers. And Mark, Groucho stands up with a cigar, does a promenade around the stage, place goes nuts, I get paid. <laughs> and that was it. Came out in a book. Only this could happen in the internet. We put it together in a little book, and we actually had two more in the debate series. Uh, another Chicago person there, Robert Hutchins, and other people debating on Congress and so forth. Two weeks ago, right, I get an email out of the blue from a, a person who used to be at Rignery Publishing, a Chicago company. And he says, a friend of mine was going through the closet and found tape recordings of this debate. Would you like them? And so, yes, I would. And we're going to post them as a historical thing. But what it, what it taught me was something very interesting. People outside of science are extremely interested in science. I'm interested, I was interested in what they did. And it began to interact. So Buckley, of course, went on to his uh, firing line series. And I, we, were, we became very close friends. And, uh, and so here is a show that I advised him to put together with David Premack and uh, Nate Azarin talking about uh, uh, moral behavior or something. And uh, the next one was with uh, B.F. Skinner and Don Mackay, the, the British neuroscience philosopher. 
And then we finally got Skinner and Leon Fessinger together. Now, interestingly, now these are competing with, you know, the king of wherever, uh, the, the senator from X, the, all, all the major political people at the time, and yet these shows uh, had a, a, a greater appeal, which I find is a fascinating point and one to uh, take, uh, take pride in. And it turned out that then that has an effect on you, and I got sort of into this, and I started putting together small meetings of people with different points of view, and I realized that that's what I learned, that it was so much fun, it was so interesting, everybody liked it, that you could then uh, do this uh, within your field of study. And these are two meetings, uh, to give an example, this was a meeting, in, and we went there for a week to hash out, uh, you know, what is neurobiology going to say about memory? And I just remember Francis Crick's recurring line, wanted to wring his neck on after a while, which is, everybody get up to tell them their stuff, you know. And he would say, well, that's solvable in principle. What you really need to do is move on to the next thing. And of course, he was right. But it's not music you want to hear, particularly. Uh, <laughs> and then the next one here was in Morea. There's Mike Posner, Steve Hilliard, Ted Bullock, Gary Lynch, Stan Schachter. We just put these things together. And these were, became kind of the birth of the thinking behind a lot of uh, jo joining the field of cognitive neuroscience. And the impact of my life on Fessler is, it was great. Uh, uh, we used to have a study group, straight biology, where we were doing psychology. So Premack, you know, had his principal head, the whole notion that there are reinforcers and things that were reinforced. He sort of had this relativity thing going. And so I said, well, to myself, if that's true, then this classic lesion that everybody was studying at the time, lateral hypothalamic lesions produce rats that don't drink. Okay, they, they don't drink water. And I said, but I bet you they certainly would like to run, right? So if you're, if you're correct, these adipsic rats who sit in their cage and will not drink, if you give them an opportunity to run, will they drink in order to run? And they just slurp the water right up. So this gave rise to lots of uh, ideas and things I pursued over the years on, on what amounts to instant plasticity. So what is recovery? Uh, how static can you think the brain is when you can just change the reinforcement ranges and the whole behavior uh, changes. I thought this was a fabulous experiment, right? No one gave a damn about it, so I moved on. Uh, <laughs> then we get called back to what we know about. And the East Coast series of patients all started carrying out split brain procedures to control epilepsy for the very same reason that they did in uh, uh, California originally. Uh, the Dartmouth group, <coughs> and most of them actually now I think about, it, uh, decided in, in, the, in the original split brain experiment there was a full section of the corpus callosum and this other little commissure at the base of the brain called the anterior commissure. They would do the whole thing. And uh, the latter group of surgeons, these surgeons you see here, decided not to cut the the anterior commissure. And uh, they, th they thought that just increased risk of infection and the rest, and so they, they didn't. But neurobehaviorally, which is where we, where we came in, it didn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, learned some more things. We learned about the specificity of pathways. But this is a, should be, this was our first case, JW, our second case, JW, in the, in the East Coast series. And, and so see if you can, Watch this video, you can see the experiment happen right in front of you. So JW is fixating a point, just like we're talking about. Fixate the point, so everything to the right of the fixation is going to the left hemisphere, everything left to the right hemisphere. And in fact, I provide here what he's seeing. He's seeing the word sun is going to the left speaking hemisphere, okay? And this black and white line drawing of a traffic light is going to his right hemisphere. Now, at this point in JW surgery, only half of the callosum is cut, the posterior half. Posterior half is rich in the interconnections of vision and somatosensory information. So he has the whole anterior half of the callosum still intact, OK? Question is, how does he respond? Does he act like a fully split pa patient? Is some stuff going to leak across? And uh, in fact, that's exactly what happened. And we got to this by, uh, you'll, see, you'll see me 
querying him, trying to see if, we can, if he can figure out in the left hemisphere what the right hemisphere saw. Somehow the primitives, the, the Gnostic units, the semantic primitives, were moving forward, somehow being presented to the part of his right brain that the left brain they either you think would transfer it in some way or the left brain could query it by this uh, interrogation method and he arrives at the answer. So those remaining fibers were somehow uh, communicating this information. So in this little simple test, uh, you know, in a normal brain flash the word night to the left visual field, it would go to your right hemisphere, back over to your left, and you'd say the word night. In a partial split, which is what Joe was there, uh, he got so good he would learn, he would play this 20 questions with himself. So you would flash the word night, and then he would say, uh, I have a picture in mind, but can't say it. And then he's two fighters in a ring, ancient, wearing uniforms and helmets on horses, trying to knock each other off. So when he's talking like this, of course, everybody's hearing it, right? And then he guesses the, the correct answer, night. Fully split the brain, none of that. So somehow those higher order units were being communicated in these more anterior regions of the uh, Colosa. Journey and the family van there and, and a little uh, uh, camping trailer I had, we converted it. And uh, then we would decide that the family van was uh, getting a little old and a little dangerous, go sliding around. It's like driving in Chicago, in Vermont. Uh, you know, you gotta know what you're doing. And uh, so I was putting in an NSF grant and Joe Ledoux was my uh, postdoc at the time, been, been my grad student. And uh, I said, you know, why don't we get an Eleganza? GE makes, I mean, GM makes this fantastic travel. It was the envy of everybody's eye. 32,000 bucks, put you right in that guy. So we write at the NSF grant, and I put it in under, you know, supplies or something. <laughs> 32 grand. And I called Joseph in an office who can write nobody else, and uh, I said, Joseph, we need a budget justification for this. <laughs> so he wrote this one-page description that was better than John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie. <laughs> yeah. Send off the grant, wait your nine months, phone call comes in, uh, NSF guy, and he says, uh, well, good news and bad news. And I said, what's the bad news? Well, you didn't get the grant. I said, well, what's the good news? You got the Elegant. <laughs> And then we were talking. We were, we were really doing that. We, we were high flying up there. Once a month, we'd be up there uh, working away. Uh, we were testing these patients, and we'd always had a set of questions from split brain work. You know, you flash something, what did you see? You didn't see something on one side. You could talk about it on the other. And we did variations on that. And, uh, but we were really uh, shocked one afternoon when we figured out to ask the question differently. And instead of, of asking, patients what they saw, and then after they would respond, we just changed the question, why did you do that? And so the test was simple enough, to show a picture of a chicken claw to the left brain, and the most appropriate answer to point to was a chicken, and a snow picture of a snow scene to the right brain, and the most appropriate answer would be the shovel. So you do this simple test, the patient responds just like that, like you see in the cartoon, and I, I swear, it was as simple as, instead of saying, well, what did you see? We said, well, why did you do that? And this was case PS, the first time we, we did this. Uh, I said, why did you do that? And Paul says, um, oh, that's simple. Chicken claw goes with the chicken. This is his left hemisphere talking. So it's the chicken claw goes with the chicken. And then looking down at his left hand, he says, and you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. <laughs> so. I remember Joseph and I looked at each other, what's that? Anyway, what was that was the start of 20 years of research on this, this, this notion, concept of the interpreter. There's something in that left brain that needs to explain uh, what is going on uh, in your actual behavior and your, the behavior produced that is observable to the left brain. The left brain can see all this stuff going on. Your hand goes out and does something, you want an explanation for it immediately. 
and uh, it supplies it. Here's an example in JW uh, of an interpreter uh, experiment. Let's see if I've learned this now. So his uh, the left hemisphere saw the word red, and it's directing the left hand, uh, because he can do it out of either, to the red pen versus a bunch of other colors. So he picks the right color. And the right hemisphere saw the word banana. And he's just told to see, draw what he sees. So it was time to move again. And uh, uh, for lots of reasons, we were interested in neurologic patients, uh, probably one of the richest sources of ideas for mind-brain uh, uh, mechanisms. And I moved to uh, uh, Cornell, uh, uh, to uh, Fred Plum's uh, uh, department, who was interested uh, uh, in developing neuropsychology, much to his credit. And of course, uh, his partner in, in crime, Jerry Posner, across the street at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, Mike Posner's brother, by the way, for the psychologist, uh, one of the great neurologists. And uh, at Rockefeller on the other corner, so there was Cornell, Sloan Kettering, and Rockefeller was uh, the great cognitive psychologist, uh, George Miller. And we just decided over many episodes to try to look at what uh, what happened, not by disconnection phenomena, which is what I had studied, uh, was to look at the effects of lesions and what they can teach us about uh, how we can understand the mental basis, of, uh, the brain basis of many mental phenomena. And as every neurologist knows, uh, it's an ending source of uh, stimulation and excitement to, to study uh, uh, patients. And I just have a little sampling here for those of you, the students who may not get this. I think part of every, by the way, every course, social neuroscience, integrative neuroscience, ought to include a course on, on neurologic grounds if, if you want to be excited about phenomena. Anyway, here's a couple of phenomena that, that I think you should find interesting. Here is an MIT graduate who uh, has productive anomia. He can't get to a noun. Otherwise, uh, he could buy and sell you 500 times with his various companies. Whoop. There we go. Uh, this may not work. Oh, wait, wait. No, I got it. I'm getting, I'm getting good at this. Wait a minute. There we go. Where did your business start? Where was the first start? Where did your business start? specific disorder of uh, what uh, is called productive anomia. And uh, so the neurologic clinic continues to give you insights about modularity and their distribution. Here's a, this case here is not that common, but, but all, 
all uh, behavioral neurologists see it uh, during their career, a case called, uh, suffering from something called reduplicative paramnesia. People think they're somewhere else in space. Otherwise, they're completely normal. They have a disruption of their space processing center, their, their personal space and where they are at a point. And so here's this uh, particular patient who was a, uh, a patient of uh, Jerry Posner. Oh. And this is a, a, a Wernicke's aphasia, and, uh, and the other one is another case. So, and it's just time I'll just go on. But, and uh, there are patients, uh, these are patients, uh, put simply in the simplest form, uh, if you show them a finger, uh, you say, in their right visual field, and you show them a finger in your left visual field, and you do two, one, one, two, do all the manipulations, they, ne they deny presentation of this figure if you do it simultaneously. Uh, so you can, if you do this, what, what do you, how many fingers you see? They say one. How many fingers you see? You say two. Then you do this together. They just deny this one exists at all. Double simultaneous extinction. Well, the question became to us, because we're, the, we're the, the cognitive guys, you know. We said, well, what happens to that information? Is it in the brain somewhere? Can it be used? Maybe there's a, an unconscious part of the brain. We were, we were conscious empirical. So is there an unconscious part of the brain? 99.9% .9 of it is unconscious, right? So we show, take this simple uh, patients for this. We would show them an apple in one field. What do you see in the apple? Show it in the other field. What do you see in the apple? Then we put up an apple in the comb, and they'd have to judge whether the two stimuli were same or different, right? Just all real simple judgment. It turns out they were perfect at it. They could easily do it. And on the, ju the uh, uh, trials where they they correctly judged different. Uh, we'd ask them what the other stimulus was. They had no idea what it was, but they got the answer right. So the information was going in at some level of consciousness, uh, of, of the brain processing system, and being utilized for the decision. The decision was being announced to the conscious system, uh, but the rest of the information stayed isolated. So one final point on the least understood points about uh, split brain research. Uh, is the following, that uh, the left brain doesn't seem to miss the right brain at all, right? Now, think about it. Think about it. You're going to have your brain split tonight, all right? And tomorrow morning you're going to wake up, and you're not going to be able to comment on anything to the left of fixation. So, looking at me, wouldn't you miss the fact that you're seeing my hand? These patients wake up and they don't see or comment on what's going on behind you. So what happens with the surgery is this part of your brain, uh, this part of your visual field, mirror is merely extended all the way over to the midline with respect to the left hemisphere, uh, speech and interpretive hemisphere. So it sees nothing wrong. Nothing's gone wrong. So it gives rise to the wacky idea that maybe, in fact, the mechanisms that enable our conscious experience of all these domain-specific, lateralized, modulized, well, however you want to do it, are local to that actual subsystem. The consciousness enables those local subsystems. It's not something that goes on and then goes to some marvelous box that makes it you consciously aware of it. So this gives. Uh, rise to many things, but I will move on to two last points, uh, one of which is that the Rockefeller Bar uh, is a great place. It has this annoying little cartoon up there on the wall. Two guys sitting around a fire, <coughs> and one says to the other, yeah, I invented fire, but what's he done lately? <laughs> right? this, this is a motivate you. It's a motivational cartoon at the bar, so don't spend too much time here. So. George and I used to meet there all the time, and that's where we got the idea of these uh, summer book, the, the summer institutes, which we, we uh, uh, every five years we take a, a stock of ourselves and, and, and put out this book. Wow. I was invited to be on the President's Council on Bioethics 2001 by Leon Koss, a distinguished member of your faculty for many years. And he was asked by President Bush to put this thing together, and we were supposed to deal with many bioethical questions. And when he called, it was right after 9-11, everybody was feeling that we wanted to do something extra. 
And uh, we had a nice talk, and I said, yeah, but I'm not a bioethicist. And he says, no, 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 no. He says, you leave that to, you know, to me. <laughs> what, what we're going to do is we're going to have a committee about bioethical issues, but we want specialists from all fields uh, putting in their, their two cents. So I have to say it was really one of the great uh, intellectual experiences of my life. Uh, and we all showed up. And uh, it was full of hot button issues and stem cell issues. But one of the great treats, of course, was meeting your other incredible colleague here, uh, Janet Rowley. And on the committee, uh, there were various coalitions that, that formed to stake out uh, a scientific position uh, on matters. And uh, she was uh, always leading the pack. Uh, to someone who really wasn't socially involved in stuff, that if you get sucked into it, and you're there as practicing your scientific role, where you actually know something about what an embryo is and isn't, it's hard not to get sucked into it. Because you, all you're there, you're, you're not passing judgment on anything. You say, well, look, this is what that is, full stop. And when people just disliked, you didn't say anything, it gets you involved. And you want to do more and get involved. So this, you take none of this lightly. You, you, you should, everybody should do it. Uh, but uh, re realize when you're getting into these areas, you're going to be busy. Uh, there, I wrote a little book about it. But, but it has, one of the questions came up in determinism, free will, and all the rest. And word gets out that you're thinking about these things. So uh, a couple years ago, I was invited to uh, Pontifical Academy of Science. Uh, heavy stuff. And there's the Pope. And I was feeling pretty important with this, I want to tell you. <laughs> and I get home, and my wife says, oh, how'd it go? I said, oh, it was uh, really good. It was really interesting. and learned a lot, the history of the place, and so forth. She says, well, did, did you have an impact? <laughs> Only a wife can ask this question. Right? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. But a month later, the Pope resigned. <laughs> I got her. I got her. Is the question of whether we're dealing with a situation where we should be using the term supersede or supervene. And this was really spelled out and set up <coughs> at the Vatican 50 years earlier by my mentor, Roger Sperry. <coughs> and he put it this way. So he says, similarly, when it comes to brains, remember always first that the simpler electric, atomic, molecular, and cellular forces and laws, though still present and operating, have all been superseded, superseded in brain dynamics by the configurational forces of higher level mechanisms. At the top in the human brain, these include the powers of perception, cognition, and so forth. So that means something is on top. The middle properties are on top, and they're in a causal chain of events. That's a very, very nice idea. Neuroscientists absolutely hate that idea because you, they think you're, you're sneaking in a spoof. Right? There's something there that's not uh, scientifically solid. Uh, Francis Crick, while the whole may not be the simple sum of the separate parts, that's a hedge, its behavior can at least in principle be understood from the nature and behavior of its parts plus the knowledge of how all these parts interact. That is called by the philosophers supervene, that there is no mental state that is not generated by a corresponding change in the underlying uh, physical state. And uh, the philosophers call that supervene. So it's the issues between supersede or supervene. And Crick has powerful allies. And Feynman said, you can't say A is made of B or vice versa, all mass is interaction. So this issue, I think, should be worked out. Because if, if we're trying to really understand how the brain enables mind, we better get this part of it straight. Because the kind of model you're going to entertain, I think, is, is totally different. Now, well, there you go. And there's a, oh, that's shameless. Thank you. Questions? You want questions or should we go drink? <laughs> Perfect. Let's go drink. <laughs>